life is very rich with meaning, and meaning is a part of what life is. And semiosis is a really important part of what I'm going to be talking about here. But the main focus of this presentation is what we call semiotics. And so I'm going to first break down what the word semiotics means and what I'm talking about here. So semiotics is an ancient Greek word. It means uh, the study of signs. Now the premise behind the modern field of semiotics is that our world, the way that we approach the world is not just perception. So a conventional way of understanding things might be that a person, when they are looking, or any organism, at their experience, let's say in this case a, uh, a tree, though you could use any example, is seeing it, and they're just looking at something that's there. Um, but the premise of semiotics is that there is a continual process of interpretation and whenever we approach something in the world, we're always bringing our experiences into it, and it's a continual process of understanding. So rather than simply looking at the world, the premise behind semiotics is more like a, uh, a cycle. So this occurs perhaps in the most obvious way at a level of symbols. When we think of the language that we use and the symbols that we draw, people mean things by them, but for example, if somebody looks at the uh, shirt that I'm wearing right now, they see two bass clefs turned towards each other if they have any familiarity with music theory. Or perhaps if they don't have any familiarity at all, it just looks like some sort of part. But for those who know who Vibe Squad is, they would recognize that this is actually his symbol. And so, Depending on what kind of experience you have and what your background is, the way that you understand things is going to be different. This is a process of semiosis. Semiosis, another way of explaining it is saying that it's meaning taking place, or the process of meaning, and it sort of translates to sign action. In other words, thinking. And so semiotics, the study of signs, is sort of like a thinking about thinking, or metasemiosis. Semiotics can describe the field of study, but it can also describe the approach we take to life when we, instead of taking things in a definitive way as meaning what they do, we're constantly asking the question, what does this mean, and why does it mean what it means? What am I bringing to this situation that makes it meaningful to me in the way that it is? And doing that is engaging in semiotics. It's a constant feedback process. And what I'm talking about, some of the people here may not have thought about before, or many of you may have thought about it in your own words. And we have the word semiotics for it because we could just be talking about, um, I'm thinking about meaning, and I'm asking about the meaning of meaning. It's useful to use an ancient Greek term. Uh, it comes from the ancient Greek semiotikos. And so this talk is about taking a semiotic approach to life. As I've said, not taking things for granted. And in order to sort of get a sense of the weight of what I'm talking about, I'd like to talk about what's called semiotics of nature theory, which fits um, human life and semiotic understanding into uh, nature as a whole. And it premises that all of nature, down to the level of a single cell organism, engages in a basic form of semiosis. So that's where I'm going to start here. If you take a single-celled organism, and let's give it some little furs here, because that's how they move around, these little uh, flagella. A cell is separated from the rest of the world by a membrane, and it's been observed that depending on changes in the environment of the cell, uh, suppose there's some nutrients present here, the cell detecting this through the receptors that are able to recognize these differences in the surroundings will move towards the nutrients in the environment. And so in a sense, the cell reads and it interprets its environment. And this could be viewed as a very basic process of semiosis, or as I said before, meaning in action. Now, all organisms
organisms are composed of a complex network of cells. Semiosis takes place with plants as well. If we think of a plant as being like a amalgam of cells, plants will grow and turn their leaves towards the sunlight in order to receive it. Plants also have a rudimentary form of exchanging signals or signs. A type of plant called the fava bean, when it has an aphid uh, salt come to it, it releases a type of chemical that alerts its neighboring fava bean plants to attract an aphid parasite. So first the plant attracts a parasite that eats the aphids, thus saving the plant. And in doing so, the neighboring plants receive that chemical signal and they realize, oh, there's aphids here, before they're even attacked by aphids. And so in this way of exchanging signals, plants actually engage in a rudimentary form of semiosis. So I drew a single dot here to show that like the cell, the plant cannot necessarily not do what it does. It has a limited degree of what we call semiotic freedom. And as life has evolved to become more complex, it developed a greater degree of freedom. So when we think of the next step or level in this process of semiosis throughout life, we have animals who have perceptive apparatus. And so I draw here two circles as a sort of diagram to show the relating to the environment. Animals like us, we're animals, we perceive and detect changes in the environment. We notice the smell of water or a change in the atmosphere being a sign of rain. And as I've said before, a sign is not necessarily just a word or a symbol. Uh, a sign is anything that we detect and understand. A great example is a dove. And birds are very intelligent organisms. A dove, when it notices a predator uh, approaching its nest, it will actually feign illness or sickness and act as though it's in an injured flight pattern and it'll kind of hobble away, luring the predator further and further away from its nest until it's gotten the predator far enough away and suddenly it flies off. It wasn't sick at all. Uh, this shows that animals are able to recognize and in the uh, theoretical language index signs in their surroundings and they have this network within their thought of interaction and meanings. And it seems plain when we think about it. For those of you who have pets or a dog, um, I know when I think of my little dog, he will sometimes hesitate before he listens to my commands. He'll sit there and look at me, and he appears almost to be thinking, should I do this or not? Clearly there's some sort of process of interpretation or meaning going on there. And how far you want to go with that depends on how far you want to base that in factual evidence. But what is clear is that animals have a greater degree of semiotic freedom than plants. In semiotics of nature theory, this is called emergent complexity. In other words, life becomes more and more complex as it evolves. And with this increase in complexity comes an increase in complexity of perceptions that are taken in and therefore an increase in what's called semiotic freedom. And so at the next level, we have the level that we occupy, humans. In what seems postulated by biology as almost a leap in evolution, some people wonder what's the missing link? What makes us humans so special and different from other animals? That we are so intelligent, that we have this complex world that we live in and come up with all these theories and stories. Well, in fact, it's not some sort of magical or inexplicable thing. In semiotic theory, it is actually the existence of our language. And that's why I drew a third dot here, completing the diagram. In perceiving this relation and the relating that takes place within the perceiving, humans come up with a word for that. For example, tasting that something is sweet or sour, you can taste that and any animal can do that. But we have this world of language that we live in, so we have a name for that. And we have names for all kinds of things. We have names for emotion, anger, sadness. We have names for objects, trees, the sky, the wind. These things that don't show up as things, but simply are part of it, our experience. When we come up with names for them, they become things in our environment. And I want to get back to the real significance of that in a little bit. It seems 
as though all of nature is a continual thinking process. Rather than a bunch of dead matter interacting, it is an understanding and semiosis that takes place, much like the mind that we normally attribute only to humans. So a great way of putting it, I think, that I am borrowing from one of the semiotics of nature theorists is that human mind is not the only mind, but it's in fact simply a peculiar and unique instantiation of this general mind, which we see taking place in all of nature. So now that I've given a bit of a context for where human semiosis falls into semiosis throughout the world, well, that's what makes us semiotic beings. We don't just think and understand, we talk about what that means. We turn within ourselves and reflect. We listen, we question, and we create these conceptual objects. We name the relations. We believe the world to be the way that we tell it in our stories. And for many people, they have not come to the point of questioning the story that they've told themselves. We oftentimes describe ourselves, we come up with words into which we fit ourselves. So, I'm going to explore a few implications here. I'm going to start at a personal level. Um, welcome guys, come sit down. So, um, I just recently explained what semiotics is and semiosis and semiotics of nature theory. So, um, just to backtrack a little bit. What this presentation is about is semiotics, um, which a very simple way of putting it is thinking about thinking. It's the study of signs and all meaningful things that take place. And so a sign or a meaningful thing could be an experience like detecting that it's about to rain by a change in the atmosphere, but it can also be symbolic and based in our words and language. All animals engage in semiosis. Uh, but what makes us special as humans is that we engage in what's called semiotics. Because of our language, we don't just have a um, relating to things, perceiving and understanding them, um, but we come up with words for them. We name them and we call them things. And so we're able to weave ourselves into this story and come up with an explanation and an idea of life, uh, an idea of who we are or what things are. We have trees, we have the sky around us, wind. In actual experience at the animal level, we understand and perceive these things, but the semiotic way of understanding them is reflecting upon that and asking, what does this mean and why do I understand it to be the way that it is? And so the point of the presentation that you guys walked in on is uh, exploring the implications of that. Now I'm going to start at a personal level and move into culture and worldviews and provide some examples. So, this is you, or me, or anybody, so simply existing here. The semiotic being that we are, we like to come up with words that we fit into our environment. And I like to call words linguistic objects in a sense. Because when we say something, when we utter a vocalization, we're putting forth into the world a substantial thing in the form of sound that becomes a part of our perception and is something that we then can reflect on and perceive in itself. And it adds to what we are already perceiving in the form of semiosis. So for example, I'm going to draw this in the form of a big block up here. Here's one word you might use to describe this person. Here's another word. Me. This. We're starting pretty simple here. And uh, depending on how much weight you put into these concepts with which you understand yourself, you could be carrying a lot of weight around. And one of the things I like about the semiotic perspective of life it allows us to question these things that we define ourselves by. A great example at the personal level is emotions. We're constantly changing in the way that we're feeling, and uh, our environment changes, and our state of mind changes, and we come up with different words for these. Imagine you're carrying multiple blocks around here. say that 
that we're feeling a certain way, it's a concept that we carry around with us. We define ourselves by doing that. And that's kind of the way that we tell stories. In a way of thinking of it, our thoughts and our concepts are kind of like building blocks. And you can take these concepts, and we do. This is the world that we live in as semiotic beings, and uh, build whole castles and whole realities, all within our words and all within our languages. And I had said earlier, some of you may have thought about this before, and for some of you it may be a new course of thought. The way that you describe yourself, I'm strong or weak, I'm happy or sad, I'm this or that kind of person. A lot of times we take these stories that we tell ourselves for granted. And taking the semiotic perspective is looking within and asking yourself, what does this mean? Why do I use this word or believe that I feel, feel this way right now? And language is the most obvious place where it takes place. And uh, that's uh, what we do as people. We talk and we tell these stories. And so I think I've given a good sense of how this can work at a personal level. And this works for how you motivate yourself and how you relate to others as well. When you think about other people, you say that they're this or that kind of person. And how much do you really know about them? Well, we know our experiences that we've had with them. Your truth you give to it, the more weight that you give to it. And this is a powerful thing that we do, and it has a lot of effects. So, in a cultural level, we see this taking place all the time. There are stories that we tell, we say this or that politician is this kind of person. You know, the media is a really great example, because when you um, see the news or you see something on TV, you see a story being told that's being projected to a lot of people at the same time. A good um, kind of practice and when I say practice, it may sound kind of like work, but it can be really um, fun to just grow and develop that habit of thinking semiotically, is when you see a story like that taking place or a word being used to describe a situation, ask yourself, what are they trying to get me to think by saying that? What would most people think when they hear that? Or what do I think when I hear this story or this word? And why do I think about it in that way? And simply engaging in that reflective process allows us to expand even more and increase our power of understanding, which I'll get into a bit later. And one of my favorite applications of this is in terms of worldview. Some of you may be involved in environmental activism or have desires of uh, impacting people to take better care of the environment. And that's something for me. And so one example I like to use is there's a story people like to tell themselves and some of us tell ourselves that we're separate individuals, that we have to get things for ourselves and that um, everything we're doing is to collect something. And um, some people even go so far and it's actually a traditional story in our culture that man is supposed to conquer the world and take possession of it and get enough for himself. To be able to question that story and re-envision it in the sense of we are all connected and these ideas of self that we sort of postulate because of these differences that we see in each other uh, really aren't as strong and anchored into each other in reality as we think they are. So we think in terms of an ecosystem and everything we do sends out ripples and everything is interconnected. And by thinking in that way and having that huge shift in pers perspective, that can actually be a, a big step for a lot of people. And that's a really good example of applying semiotics to your worldview. And another level or implication I want to talk about this with is religion. We look at things like the trees and the wind and the sun, the clouds, and we talk about things like love and chaos and even war. And uh, in some cultures, like uh, pagan cultures, like the ancient Greeks, they used to have different names for these. They were gods, like Zeus, Gaia, Ares. And a common way of conceiving of that is they thought they were anthropomorphized humanoid beings up in some Olympus in the sky, which may have been true for some Greeks, uh, some Greek people walking around, but some of them may also have thought of it in a more animistic sense, um, like these gods are what is in the environment. And it was just another story that they told. And nowadays we are commonly thinking in a scientific perspective. We say this is matter interacting. We know that it's cause and effect and uh, it's dead life moving this way and that we have life and we have just rocks and stones. The rocks and stones, we don't really have names for them like gods, like the ancient Greeks did, because they were all wrong about that. 
Um, and you can believe that or not, but the point that I'm trying to make is that those are different stories that we tell and different approaches. And so a uh, fun question I like to ask is, uh, what gods do you live with in your life? What kind of world do you live in? And that is, in a very deep sense, a spiritual question. And that's applying semiotics to spirituality. At the personal level, I wanted to bring up a quote from the Zhuangzi, which is an ancient Taoist text, and I almost forgot to mention it. It gives a good sense of how we attach truth and weight to our terms, but really, how much do we really know? Lady Liang was viewed as beautiful by all the men in the village, but when she walked down the path, birds fly away from her, uh, deer run away from her, and fish swim to the bottom of the stream. Uh, these four, who holds the standard for beauty? Who really knows what beauty is? So that gives us a sense that animals view the world differently from us, but in terms of concepts like that, beauty, goodness, um, even hot and cold, based on how you perceive things and what you're bringing to it in life and your previous understanding, it could mean something different to everybody. How much do we really know? It's easy to think that you know a lot about the world. It was Lao Tzu who said that true understanding rests in not understanding. The way I interpret that is it's a realization that as we expand our semiotic repertoire, our repertoire of symbols and ways of understanding and stories of viewing the world, we realize there's so many different ways of looking at it, and all of these represent perhaps a different kind of knowledge. In reality, none of us is an ant or a deer. Um, we can't be that ant, and so it seems like there's an insurmountable limit to what we call knowledge, but that's not to say that we don't know anything. It's just to say that when we're learning, we're not exactly getting concrete knowledge, but the semiotic perspective is that it's a constant unfolding and expanding of understanding. And I like to say that the more you come to understand and the more you exercise that habit and question and ask what it means, the more power that you have to create and to continue your journey of making things happen in this world. And just the power to think of things in a different way, that really makes a huge impact in your experience. And that's a huge thing that I want people to take away from this, is not to take your stories that you're telling for granted, but to always think about what it means at a very deep level, and why does this mean what it means. Socrates, who is a very famous ancient Greek philosopher, was on trial for corrupting the youth of Athens. That's what they said he was doing, but what he was doing was going around asking people different questions. What is love? Uh, what is goodness? All kinds of different things. What is the ideal republic? And he really felt like he was trying to get to the bottom of that. And at the root, he said that he visited the Oracle of Delphi. And the Oracle um, had told him, uh, or, or his friend had visited the Oracle. Well, the Oracle said, Socrates is the wisest person in all of Athens. And uh, she left it at that, as oracles usually do. And Socrates' choice of interpreting this was that he wanted to know why did the oracle say that I'm the wisest in all of Athens. And so he went and asked people all these questions and had these dialogues with them, these conversations, and he realized that many people thought that they knew what justice was, what love was, or whoever expert on the topic he went and asked, they thought they knew. But at the end of the conversation, he realized they didn't really know. Nobody really knows. And so he deduced that perhaps the reason he was the wisest, according to the oracle, was because he was the only one who knew that he didn't know what the hell he was talking about. And that really rang out with significance to me, and I think it's a great story that's relevant to this. And so finally, I want to talk about what we call the liberation of things. When you look around and you see a tree, or you see a person, or you see anything, and you think of your word for it, and you say, this is what it is, that thing is simply being, and you are simply being. If you believe things are what you say they are, recalling the diagram I drew before of a person holding their concept, um, we have this beautiful tree here, isn't it beautiful? <laughs> and. Uh, we call it a tree. And there 
it is caught up in that concept and we say we know it, it's, it's, it's a poem and it goes through the specific kind of photosynthesis. Um, and we're not letting it be as it is if we simply believe that all it is is the word that we describe it to be. And so liberating things is simply letting them be and ring forth in what they are. You can apply this to any kind of thought or feeling that you have. Allow it to simply be as it is because the place that we exist is in this moment and semiotics can take place at the most radical level of our experience. Etymologically, the history of the word radical, it comes from radix, which means root, and the root of everything is this moment. That's what I mean when I say that we need to apply the semiotic perspective to the world at the most radical level. When you think of the human experience and what we are, let's see how much time I have left here, We have this incredibly amazing uh, ability to reflect and, and listen to our environment. Other animals seem to be better at letting things be. I mean, we can't really know because we can't look into anyone else's mind. But they don't have this language and this conceptual understanding. And yet, we can create amazing impacts because, uh, for example, we tell a story about a thousand years in the past. We say this and that happened, and this civilization was born and died, and we learned such and such lessons from them. And this entire world of the past that we believe we came from and lived in is all told through our language, through our words. The future is something that we describe and anticipate, but it's not something that is suddenly there because all we're always at is now. Things that are meaningful, like for example, thinking in an ecological perspective as opposed to a separated self perspective. Being able to take that revolution requires a reflective turn. It requires thinking and taking a semiotic approach to life, and that's something that we as humans can do, but also we can take a conqueror perspective and we can believe that we are lesser or stronger and and hate other people and hurt them and we can get settled into those grooves and take that for granted and let that be the story that we live in and let that take charge of our lives or we can take a semiotic perspective and turn within and question that and become something different and think about what really matters and what's really powerful and meaningful in life and what's good and what we can do and that instills us with what I believe is an incredibly deep sort of responsibility one of my favorite quotes comes from Voltaire, though you guys probably know it mostly from the mouth of Uncle Ben, the uncle of Spider-Man. Uh, with great power comes great responsibility. And this semiotic path that our evolution has taken, this incredible semiotic freedom and complexity that we have, is a great power. And so the more we are able to do and affect the world, the greater sense of responsibility we can have. And responsibility, I mean, not in the sense of an obligation, but in the sense that um, we're aware of the impact that our actions can have and the changes that we can make. And so by not taking action, we're just as much responsible. By not listening and being reflective and spreading that um, semiotic mindset and getting others to question, we're just as much responsible for that. But on a final note, I'd like to end with another phrase that I use. With great power comes great possibility. Always be expanding and growing your understanding because that continues to increase your power. And this festival, Sonic Bloom, is very much focused on creating the reality that you live in. And I think that the kind of castle that you can build of your concept has so many more possibilities and, and ways of being the more you expand and open yourself up to different conceptions, different ways for things to link together, and different approaches to life. And so um, that's the final note I'd like to end with. And I invite you all to think for yourselves and question everything in the immortal words of Bass Nectar. <laughs> If anyone uh, would like to add anything or um, have a discussion with me, we have about nine minutes left. So, and if not, that's fine. <laughs> but I'm open to, to continue this conversation. What turned you on to Ah, that's a great question. In completing my philosophy degree at UNC, 
I found myself constantly thinking um, that language played a really important role in the way that we interact with the world. But I also, having read a lot of Taoism and Buddhist thought, I came to realize that our language seems to fall short of really capturing what this reality is, and yet it seems to add so much to it. And I've been thinking of something to write for my uh, honors thesis, um, which is the work that this presentation was based on. And uh, something that one of my greatest inspirations in my life, this incredible professor of mine, Tom Terlogan, um, told me one day, really stuck in my mind. He proposed, so we normally say that people speak, but what if it's the case that speaking peoples? <laughs> And it sounded weird to me, uh, and I thought about it and thought about it for a long time, and I think it really stuck with me. And what I kind of realized is that it means that the idea of people as separate people, and we're all these individuals sitting here, um, this person, that person, you and me, these are all just words that we have. And what's happening when we create these people, we're, we're speaking. Um, and I think that's probably at the bottom of um, the train of thought that eventually led to me coming up with the idea of words as linguistic objects, was speaking peoples. Uh, in other words, we don't have people without speaking. And I like to think of speaking as not just talking, but um, thinking in conceptual terms, too. When you think in terms of this and that, and you kind of have this dialectic or dialogue-type thought in your head, that is like a conversation with yourself. And so thinking is a lot like speaking when you're doing it at a linguistic level. So it's not just talking. That's probably a, a good way of saying how I got into it. And then I was also really interested in what sets us as humans how we relate to other animals and what makes us human as opposed to other animals. And I kind of hone in through my research on realizing that it is very simply just the fact that all life is semiosis, but humans with our language are semiotic beings. And um, yeah, it's, it all started with the question is, uh, how does language relate to consciousness? That was really the vague starting question um, when I began my research. Yeah.
Um, we are capable of that. I think it's a process that happens naturally. Um, though I also, um, I don't know if it would necessarily be my role to push that new linguistic development, but it's also very possible to conceive of a, uh, another form of life, perhaps on another planet, that has taken another leap in complexity and in uh, linguistic development and has a further refined level of se semiotics. And I do believe that will happen in the course of our evolution over the course of thousands and millions of years, not just for us humans, uh, but for other species if we allow them the time to evolve and have that development into language. Um, and uh, I think there are those of us who can push a new form uh, or a new language that opens further avenues to understanding. Does that answer your question? Yes, let me see. How much time do we have left? Uh, three minutes left. Okay, go ahead. Uh, okay, so uh, I guess what I was wondering is, um, so you're saying how, like, how, like, oh, uh, I talked to my dog. It's obviously like your state situation. It's obviously like a right? Like, it waits for a second. Yeah. To pass the call it. So, like, um, that being a, like, uh, a product of the investigation of the animal, does that, um, I guess what I was wondering is if someone, if someone, uh, like, you're talking about, uh, the symbiotics being developed like, through evolution, right? Yeah. So, uh, then that's like more of a macro way of thinking about it. Well, on the micro scale, on the day to day basis, like, could someone's experiences in the world, uh, help to develop their symbiotic, I guess, abilities, or like, or like, or help to make their perception things more symbiotic, or do they, do they hinder them? Because it helps them write, the, as you were saying, like their own narrative. Like they take their experiences, they put them into other ones, even if they're new experiences. Well, I think it happens both ways. And um, the reason I'm so passionate about what I'm talking about is because um, some of us may have explored that, but many people, I think, um, do narrow themselves um, into a certain set of words or a certain way of understanding. Whereas I do also think that people kind of start to ask those questions and really open themselves up. And even in uh, philosophy class where you think a lot of people want to question and learn things, there are people who still feel like, oh, I have to find the right philosophy. I have to find what the, the truth is in the sense of understanding things in one specific way that's really narrow. Um, and in doing so, um, perhaps without realizing it, they close themselves off to other possibilities. Um, so I really do um, like the idea of inspiring people to take that semiotic perspective uh, rather than what uh, I would contrast with the definitive perspective. In other words, rather than defining things, we're always understanding things and um, wondering about what they mean and acknowledging that I call this knowledge perhaps, but also recognizing that there probably is a different story to tell. Um, and I think we can really play a role uh, in inspiring each other to do that in small ways or in very big deliberate ways by giving a speech like I just gave today. Um, however um, works for you um, and um, each person and we're all on our different paths. So, right off. <laughs> David. That's it. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Good job, guys.